introduce uh, Professor Scotty for me. So Professor Scott uh, has got a number of seminal, seminal contributions in the area of artificial neural networks, including but not limited to flip-flop. Uh, so all this while we assume that we know an architecture for a neural network. But Professor Scott is going to be talking about how to build a neural architecture from scratch. So I think I'll let uh, Professor Scott take it on. Have they actually heard something about QuickProp before? Yes, they did. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, nice to be here, and uh, as I understand it, you've heard uh, about QuickProp and vanilla backprop, so uh, I was working on this stuff like back in 1982, I was able to recruit this uh, fellow I kept running into at meetings, uh, a guy named Jeff Hinton, you may have heard of him. Uh, he was at CMU for about seven years and busy in the office next to mine inventing backprop and, and Boltzmann machines. Uh, but he, he didn't enjoy the military funding in the U.S. and some of those kinds of things, so he, uh, he eventually went to Canada, which worked out pretty well for him uh, in Toronto. The Canadian money never was a huge amount, but it never completely went away. What I'll be talking about is some stuff I did before all the neural network uh, money pretty much went to zero in the US. So I went off and did some other stuff and I'm still doing other stuff. Uh, anyway, what I'll be talking about today is cascade correlation algorithm and architecture for deep learning. Uh, this is arguably the first deep learning system. Uh, well, I'll tell you about that. So two ancient papers, one in 1990 with Chris Labierre uh, introducing the basic cascade correlation architecture. And then the following year there was a recurrent version that got published. And I'll be talking about both of those today. As you can see, these were like 28 years ago. And uh, this thing really is a kind of deep learning. Uh, as we will see, it builds up the architecture of the network. Instead of standing back and kind of looking at the problem and saying, well, what worked last time? Uh, two convolutional layers of a, a million units each and so on and so on. Uh, this thing just builds the network it thinks it needs for the problem at hand. Uh, and it actually is able to build networks that, ha that are deep but narrow, not thousands and thousands of units in each, uh, in each layer. And uh, it was building things that uh, were 15, 20, 30 layers deep uh, way back in the day. So, uh, you know, and then the money went to zero. I went off and did other stuff. Uh, the original Cascor paper got a lot of citations, but then everybody's completely forgotten about it. Uh, I've been trying to resurrect it with a student or two. Uh, anyway, the... Uh, these algorithms routinely built useful feature detectors 15 to 30 layers deep. It builds just as much network as it thinks it needs. It solves some problems that were considered hard at the time. Now these will be laughably small by current standards. But these were things that people could not do very well with backprop and with uh, sort of 1988, 1990 vintage machines. You know, the, the workstation in your office. Nobody had GPUs. Those hadn't been invented yet, I don't think. There were some big old silicon graphics machines and things that were kind of a huge GPU, but uh, there were no GPUs built into laptops or anything like that. Uh, it ran uh, on a single core 1988 vintage workstation. We never obviously attacked the huge data sets that people are attacking today. Uh, but I think this architecture could be adapted to do that. And I've got a PhD student and one undergrad working to uh, get this ported to PyTorch and some things like that. OK. So there were two problems I was working on back in the day. Uh, one was it was entirely too fiddly. We were guessing learning rates. You know, you'd use the one that worked last time, and then you'd fiddle with it. Learning rate was either too big or too small, and that's why I got into this quick prop thing. The idea was to take the derivative of the error with respect to each of the weights, and instead of just taking a standard size step using a, some learning rate parameter, it would take a tiny step, take another partial derivative, 
uh, of the error with respect to each weight. And now you've got two slopes, and you fit a parabola through it. And that gives you a pretty good estimate of where the bottom of the curve is. And you do this independently for each of the weights. And this sped up the learning quite a bit. More importantly, it took away the burden of guessing what the uh, learning parameters ought to be. Okay, oh, we'll use uh, 0.03, you know. Well, that's good for one problem, it's not good for the next, and it might be good for this weight and not for that weight in the network. Uh, so quick prop got us a nice speed up, uh, 10x in a lot of problems. Uh, but I still thought back prop was slower than it ought to be. Uh, so I spent a long time thinking about that and why is it too slow and I came up with two observations. Built some little things so I could see what the hidden units were doing, you know, some little displays so I could kind of look into the net as it was learning. And then I, instead of, most people dive right into the math, but instead of doing that I was trying to figure out, you know, what each unit is trying to do, what it's optimizing, what it's seeing. That's just the way I tend to think. Everybody else likes to, to get right into, into math. I'm trying to visualize the problem as seen by one of the units in the network. So the first thing is that all the targets are moving. They're all being trained at once. So I see some error coming back and I'm trying to adjust my weight so I can neutralize that error. But other units are changing things too, and so the error I'm seeing is always changing, and I'm running this way and that way, okay? Uh, because all units are being updated at once, they're all interacting, and they're affecting one another, and it's very inefficient. Uh, and what, what developed from that is what I called the herd effect. So, Suppose you have a network and it needs a layer with six hidden units, okay? It's a pretty simple problem. Six hidden units in one layer, okay? Uh, you start them with different random weight initialization, so they're not all in the same place initially in the space of possible feature detectors. But there's some error, and usually the error has a big component and then lesser components. And if you need six hidden units, that means there are six distinct jobs to be done. Okay, you don't want them all doing the same thing. That's, they're redundant, it doesn't buy you anything. You may as well just have one unit. Okay, so if there are multiple hidden units in a layer, you want them all to be doing different jobs. And then you can cancel six components of the error instead of just one six times. Okay, so what we would see is that, and there's no central authority saying you're going to do this job, here's your piece of the error, here's your piece of the error, everybody go do it. There's no communication like that, there's no central authority. All they're seeing is the error components coming back and they're adjusting their weights accordingly. Okay, so what happens is that there'll be a big component, you know, sort of first eigenvector of the error, and they'll also, oh, there's the big error, let's go. And they all go charging over that way from different starting spots. And somebody gets there and manages to effectively cover, cancel out that error, and they all kind of skid to a halt because there's momentum, right, in these learning rates. So they all go skidding to a halt. Wait, we were all headed over here, but now there's no error coming back from there. That got fixed by this guy who got there first. So, oh, well, now what should we do? Oh, there's some more error over there. Let's go over there. So they all go thundering over there, including the guy who got the first piece of error because he doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, now, oop, this is uncovered. Let's go back here. And in the meantime, all this initial diversity of weights is getting washed out. They're forming into a tighter and tighter grouping. Pretty soon they're all doing the same job, or pretty much. Slight variation. And it really is like a third order effect to shake that herd apart and eventually get most of the jobs covered. But what you find is in a network where they're all doing this thing, the herd effect does take over. And you need probably 10 times as many units as you really need. Because they're not going to be doing distinct useful jobs. So you end up with a very bloated network. You can't tell what it's doing because with so many units everything is very distributed. Uh, you, can't, you can't see this guy's doing this job and this guy's doing that job because they're all doing all the jobs. It's all distributed. It's all redundant. And so this is not a good thing. So do you understand that herd effect? 
So how are we going to fix that? Well, what if we train the weights, we trained the hidden units one at a time? Then you wouldn't have the moving target problem. You put the unit into the network, it says the biggest error is here, I'm going to go get it. Goes and gets it, nails it. Freeze this guy, now we train another unit. And that's the basic idea of cascade correlation. Introduce and train one hidden unit at a time. Well, you've all seen something like this. This is, uh, this is just a uh, three input, two output, basically a perceptron. Okay, no hidden units at all. And that's the initial network we start with. Now, depending on the problem, you might have hundreds of inputs and two outputs or one output. They may be continuous outputs. They may be on off. Uh, so the problem dictates what you start with. Uh, and by the way, these vertical lines, these are adjustable weights, and this line is summing all the inputs, okay? So you've got inputs here, and this guy is adding this, this, and this input through the weights, summing them up, and producing an output, okay? So you have something like this, yeah? Do we, do we have some sort of guarantee that if we have independently trained every unit, that the best, best uh, status for every hidden unit will imply that the combined state would be best for all the hidden units when you go about it? This is a greedy algorithm. We're grabbing pieces of the air one at a time in a greedy way. Mm -hmm. You'd never get an optimality guarantee, but it's damn good in practice. Okay, I might be able to prove that it's better than the other way of doing it, but I'm not, proving things is not my strong suit. I like to invent things, I don't like to prove them. But there's no, op no claim of optimality here. There is a claim that it learns pretty fast and, uh, and produces a near minimal network. Okay, so we start again with, with no hidden units. Train this thing up. You all know about perceptrons, right? Input, output, there are problems that a perceptron can't solve, like exclusive R. Okay, that was proved by Minsky and Pappert in the book that pretty much put the original perceptron wave of enthusiasm out of business. Okay, they showed that the problem is in a perceptron, each input is voting plus or minus for each output. And it's not saying I'm going to be voting plus if you're voting minus and so on. They're not, they're not interacting with one another. So you have to have a problem that's linearly separable, basically. They can't be creating more complicated surfaces. Okay, but this does as well as it can do. Inputs to outputs, it'll go up, it'll plateau. Maybe that's good enough. In many problems, you can solve it with a perceptron. There is a separating surface. Okay, and maybe it's not good enough. So let's assume it's not good enough. There's some residual error we want to get rid of after we've trained this thing and it plateaus. Okay, what do we do then? Well, let's add a hidden unit. So suppose we can train up a hidden unit that correlates with the residual error. Okay, if it can correlate it, it can cancel some of it. We could add this unit with these input weights and now it's correlating with the residual error and we can add it to the network, tune all these weights again, and it will cancel out some of the error and maybe these guys will redistribute who's doing what by training these. But when we put this unit in, we're going to freeze its inputs. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. Well, this will go up. It should do a little better. We're correlating with the error and we put a unit in and now it should uh, be able to do, cancel out more of the error. So it should be doing a little better, yeah? And, uh, and almost always it does. Uh, but it reaches a plateau. Are we happy? Yes. Declare victory and go home. See? Very minimal network, only one hidden unit. If we're not happy, if there's more residual error to get rid of, then we better add another hidden unit. So we train this one up to correlate with the residual error. We train its input weights. And interestingly, it can look not only at the original inputs, but at the output of this guy. So we just created a two-layer network with two units, one unit in each layer. 
Okay, but this can do something more complicated than this guy was able to do because it's got yet another feature to optimize over. Not three, it's got four, and one of them is a composite feature that we just created. Okay, and we put him in, freeze his weights, train these up, and it should do a little better still, and on and on and on until we decide we're happy or, you know, the paper's due and we have to stop. Uh, so to summarize, we start with direct input output connect connections only and the number of inputs and outputs is determined by the problem. Train it up uh, using backprop or I always use quickprop. If the error is now acceptable, quit and go home. If not, iteratively create one new hidden unit and the way we do that actually these guys can sometimes get stuck as you're training them. It's not a uh, convex problem. Okay, so they can, they can get stuck. They don't get stuck very often, but we create a pool of like eight candidate units. Train them all up trying to correlate with the residual error that we're seeing at this point. And one or more of them will do well and some of them will get stuck and not be doing anything very interesting. Okay, so we take the very best one with the best covariance score, correlation score. Uh, they're all quiescent now, they're doing as well as they're going to do in this training cycle. And we tenure the winner. Okay, now you all know what tenure means in academia. So what tenure means in this network, we freeze his input units, we add them to the network. So just like real tenure, you're never going to learn anything new, you're done, you're frozen, and everybody has to listen to you. Okay? So uh, I kind of like that as a metaphor, but uh, at the time I was untenured. Uh, and by the way, you kill all the other candidates. They're uh, sent to the glue factory, uh, just like academia. They're, well, the glue factory in this case is Google and they pay you a lot of money. So it's not as bad as, as for cows. But uh, then you retrain the output error and you cycle until done. So pretty simple idea uh, that nobody else had at the time. Uh, and it's building this network, unit by unit, layer by layer. Well, is this any good? Here's what was considered a hard problem back in the day. A couple of hundred points arranged in two spirals. Okay. And the idea is you've got one, you've got two continuous inputs, okay, and you want to say yes or no, black or white. So one output, one binary output, two continuous inputs, a couple of hundred training points, but it's a hard, you're not going to solve this with a perceptron, right? This is definitely not linearly separable. You can't put any separating plane through this that's going to do anything very useful. Uh, we trained up cascade correlation on this. It created 12 hidden units, and this is the output of one of the network, one of the ones. You know, we tried it a bunch of times, obviously. Uh, it would create between uh, like 12 and 17 units, depending on the run. 12 is about the best it ever did. I have not proved that that's the best it could do, uh, but that's the best result we ever got. And you can see here, not only has it learned to get all of these training points correct, but it's doing a pretty good job of generalization. Now, a really good job of generalization wouldn't have these little gaps and furry bits. But you can see that it's not just getting this point right, it's getting... If we had other points along the spiral, it would get almost all of them right. If we came in with the training case. So it's actually kind of learned the structure of these spirals with some gaps and some fur. Okay? So, uh, interestingly, uh, it's easy in a cascade correlation net to see what the units are doing because there aren't so many of them. And they all have distinct jobs. They're not wandering around. So, uh, oh, well, the first thing is that, uh, and these trials were taking like, on the old hard way, they were taking half an hour each and I was trying to run 50 trials or something. You know, it was taking all night. Uh, and in those days, that was unthinkable. The, the computers only stayed up for maybe a day, you know, and then Unix would crash. Uh, this, this is a long time ago. 
Okay. Uh, the best published result up to that point was standard backpropagation with shortcut connections, direct connections from each layer to the outputs. Uh, a 25551 network. That was huge by standards of the day, believe it or not. It took 20,000 presentations of the entire 200 point training set. Uh, and it solved it. Uh, didn't reliably solve it, but they got solutions. Okay, not every time. And it was about one billion link crossings. A link crossing is a multiply by a weight, right? Multiply a value by a weight. So that, instead of looking at clock on the wall time, this was our measure of how long the thing was taking, because obviously on a faster machine or a slower machine, the, the actual training time would be different. So with QuickProp, it was uh, only twice as fast, a little better than twice as fast. It was 438 million link crossings. With cascade correlation, uh, remember it's building between 12, I guess 19 hidden units. Here's the histogram. Okay, different runs, how many units it built. Uh, the one I showed you was one of the 12 unit solutions, so it's a little smoother than some of the others. But it was 1,700 epics instead of 20,000. So it's 10 times faster uh, in epics. And in this case, uh, let's see, 20 million link crossings, uh, so. Uh, what, 50? Am I doing that right? Yeah. 50 times faster in terms of the multiplies you have to do. And that was a fairly typical result, 50, 10, 50, 100 times faster on some of these problems. So that was, that was a nice speed up, especially if you're staying up all night waiting for the stupid thing. Uh, and we could look, we could uh, do neuroscience on this thing. Uh, we could see what the units are doing. We could basically produce the receptive field of each unit. So the, the, with zero units, uh, basically when that initial perceptron with no hidden units, all it could do is put a plane through the space and uh, this is kind of a sigmoid. Okay, I only present it as three gray values, but it's sort of a sigmoid. What it's doing is it's getting a slice of black ones here and a slice of white ones there, and that's the best you can do with one separating plane, even with a sigmoid output. Now that's better than nothing, right? It's getting some, better than chance. The first hidden unit puts a slice through this way. That's what it's doing. And then if you blend that into the output, it's doing a little better. What's it doing? It's getting these blacks here, and there's a slice of blacks here it's getting. Uh, no, this slice, and then whites, it's getting this slice and these. That's with one hidden unit. Best it can do. I mean, it can't, it can't draw a crazy curve of some kind because it's just got to cut through the space. Now, it's an augmented space now because it has this additional feature, this additional dimension, if you will. Uh, okay, so, and if you blend this in, you get a receptive field of the entire network that looks like that. So, uh, let's see, the blacks are coming in there and then it's uh, white out to there. Okay, the next hidden unit, well, I'm sorry, this is the output. This is the next hidden unit it builds, which is able to come in here, complementary to this. It's able to come in here and build a little kink. So it's getting something like that. And then you can do this, which is getting still more points correct. Now that's just two hidden units. The third hidden unit, you can see it's starting to create a little hook. And that's what you want, right? That's the feature you'd like. Uh, and then it's producing this based on that hook and these, these other hidden units. And then it's creating a hookier hook. Okay, and then this, and then this. So you can see it's, it's really getting the idea in some sense. It's really getting in there and building the features it needs for this problem. After that, they usually start just grabbing chunks. 
It grabs them in a symmetrical way because it's a very symmetric problem. But the next hidden unit is just getting uh, some piece like that, and the next hidden unit's getting some piece like that, and this one's getting that, and this is picking up some random things that weren't caught before, and eventually you get to here. And then finally you get this output, we, oop, wrong direction. Come back. Finally we get to this pretty nice diagram. But the cool thing is you can see what features are being built because they're not all distributed and smeared out and redundant. Uh, maybe if you were to take a huge version of this and try it on finding cats on the internet, you'd find some cat's eye units and things like that that are actually <coughs> identifiable as such. It's very hard to do that with the current uh, deep learning nets. And so on and so on. Okay, so that's basic cascade correlation. The advantages. Uh, no need to guess the side and topology of the network in advance. It looks at the problem, it figures out what it wants to do. When you're happy, you stop. If not, you keep adding units. It can build deep nets with higher order features. We just saw that. It's much faster than backprop or quick prop. Factor of 5, 10, 50, 100, it depends on the problem, but it, it learns much faster than these big old sloppy backprop nets. Trains just one layer of weights at a time. You're either training the input weights to the candidate units to get one that correlates, that's where it spends most of its time, or you're training this one layer that's blending the outputs. No vanishing gradients as you go back through the thing. Nothing getting muddled together and weaker and weaker. No moving targets. One layer of weights at a time, and that's a very fast process. By the way, when you're training those candidate units, if you've got eight candidate units, they can be on eight different machines. They're all they're not talking to each other. Okay, they're looking at uh, their inputs and they're looking at the residual error for that input and they're doing what they do. Uh, so this is highly parallelizable. Uh, trains one layer eights at a time. It can work on smaller training sets, at least in some cases we tried, than were required for the by standard backprop. The old feature detectors are frozen. Once you create one of these units, you put it in and you freeze it. It's not going anywhere. It was a useful feature. You created it to be a useful feature. It is a useful feature. In subsequent training, it's not going to wander off. It can't. We've nailed it to the floor. Okay. So this is very good for curriculum learning. Have you talked about that at all? Uh, if you're training a big complicated deep learning net, some people use a curriculum training. They give it an easy part of the problem and it learns that and then you give it a harder version, harder version, harder version. Well this is very good for that because the initial detectors you create are not wandering off as you give it more complex training sets later. They're useful and they stay there. Okay, so you've got that unit forever unless you decide to cut it loose for some reason. Uh, so we'll see a case of curriculum training here in a little bit. And then I said, well, okay, everybody wants to do time series, uh, not just static input output. What if we created the simplest possible recurrent version of this thing? You know, it works pretty well on static inputs and static outputs. I should say before I go on to the recurrent version, uh, as soon as we published this, people started sending us these big industrial training sets that, you know, we've got this problem in sort of predicting insurance defaults and things like that. Uh, what companies to invest in. And uh, we ran a bunch of those things through. There's one guy who was taking measurements of people's feet. They had like 18 measurements and then uh, it was predicting the right shoe size. You know, I mean, every, all sorts of crazy stuff was being done. And interestingly, these industrial data sets that people had tried, you know, we tried this on three hidden units with 100 units, three hidden layers with 100 units in each. And it wasn't converging. It was converging only very slowly. It wasn't a good result. It didn't generalize. And we'd run it on Casco. It didn't, use, it didn't build any hidden units. It said, hey, this is linearly separable. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> or it would build. And, and there were an awful lot of sets out there people were trying to do deep learning on, deep learning in the day. Uh, 
and they're actually linearly separable. Or you could solve them with one or two hidden units. Okay, they really didn't need much in the way of additional features. Okay, now that, not every problem, but a surprisingly large number only needed a couple of hidden units and because people were just guessing networks and they always guessed a big one, uh, they, they never saw that. Okay, so recurrent version. We'd like to be able to give it a sequence of inputs and have it uh, produce something at the output. You know, yes, which word is it? Uh, we trained this, as you'll see, on Morse code. We gave it dots and dashes, and it told you what letter it had just seen, uh, and so on. So uh, for sequential units, the dominant thing back in the day was called Elman, Elman networks. Have you heard about those? You got a hidden layer, you take its output, you feed it back, and that's its inputs for the next time with a one-step delay. Okay, so we thought we'd try a similar thing with Cascar, but each unit would have, in addition to the inputs, okay, the original inputs and inputs from other hidden units that have been created already. We're training up a new candidate unit, and it's got this one-step delay. So there's a trainable wait here, and then waits from the inputs and the units you've already created. Okay, very, very simple addition. Just a one-unit one step delay. Okay, uh, it's trained just like CASCOR units. Uh, if it's correlating with the result, uh, then you pick a winner and you freeze it. And if you think about what this is doing, if the self-weight is strongly positive, this is like a flip-flop. Okay, if this output is one, it'll go through here, and this will be strongly one. And it's going to want to stay one unless all these other guys force it to go the other way. Okay, overwhelm the, uh, the self-weight. And if it's strongly negative, this thing will want to flip back and forth each time. Okay, it sees a one, it's getting a thing that says minus one or zero. And then it's going to flip every time unless this thing grabs it and forces it to do something else. So you see what we're doing here? Okay, you got the model? So we tried this. This is one of the things that people were using to test sequence learners back in the day, and it's called the Reber Grammar. And you take a little uh, state transition diagram like this, a B. So a typical sequence this might produce is B, T, S, S, and where there are two things leaving, you flip a coin. Okay. S, S, X, X, V, P, S, E. And when it sees the E, you're done. Okay, so that's your sequence. We presented the token sequentially, and the game is to predict the next token. Okay, and these are longer or shorter, depending how many times you went around a loop. Okay. And the idea is to learn this perfectly, if possible. So that whatever thing generated by this grammar you feed to it, it's going to get the right next character. Okay, and they were trying to do this with almond nuts. They, the rest of the world. Uh, the state of the art, an Elman net with fixed topology with recurrent units. An Elman net with only three hidden units could learn this grammar at least once. The paper reported their best result ever that they got on this thing. They didn't say how many months it took to find that. Okay. Uh, but they got a result uh, with three hidden units and it learned the grammar perfectly after seeing 60,000 distinct strings once each. Okay. With 15 hidden units, much bigger network, really big by the standards of the day, uh, 20,000 strings were sufficient. Recurrent cascade correlation, we gave it 128 training strings, not 20,000. Presented repeatedly. It learned the task building two or three hidden units of these recurrent ones. So it had two or three bits of state. And on the average, it took uh, about 200 epochs, 200 passes through these 256 presentations, or 25,000 string presentations in all, not 60,000. Uh, well, this was only 20,000, but uh, this was their best run. Yeah? But, but they used 20,000 or 60,000 distinct strings, and you only used... Distinct strings. We only used 128. 
that was enough to show the network yeah, kind of reliably what the topology was. I mean, it, it wasn't printing out the topology. It was saying what's the next character after it saw all those. Uh, and uh, all the runs we tried this on, oops, all the runs we tried this on uh, tested perfectly on new unseen strings. So it had learned that grammar. Okay, so that's, that's pretty cool, I thought. Uh, that, was, that surprised the hell out of me. I didn't think it was going to be this good. Uh, just in time for the nibs deadline, too. Uh, and then we tried it on the embedded Reber grammar. Okay, this is, you've all heard of LSTMs? Yeah? Okay, good. So this is remembering something for a long time. You get the beginning token, and then you either get a T or a P. And then you've got the Reber grammar generating an arbitrary string. And at the end, when this thing previously would have gone to E and said we're done, it has to spit out the T or the P and then do the E. Okay? So all the grammars had B, either a T or a P, arbitrary string containing, by the way, T's and P's, probably. Uh, and then it has to spit out that same token it saw right after the beginning and then do the end. Okay? So this was a really hard problem. Uh, the state of the art, uh, the Elman networks, they couldn't do it. They tried 250,000 distinct string presentations, 15 hidden units, they couldn't do it. Okay? Uh, they didn't have LSTMs. Uh, recurrent cascade correlation, we gave it 256 training strings, we presented them repeatedly. Uh, tested on 256 different strings. There we did 20 runs. On 11 of the 20 runs, it learned this thing perfectly, typically building five to seven hidden units. Okay, 11 trials out of 20. On the remaining ones, it wasn't generalizing perfectly. Uh, it hadn't quite grasped the grammar precisely. But it was doing quite well. On the whole test set, it was only getting 20, 20 errors out of 256 strings times however many tokens. So that's, that's not bad. It was generalizing well, but it was generalizing perfectly more than half of the time. Uh, training required an average of 288 epics with two, uh, about 200,000 string presentations. Now that sounds like a ridiculously small uh, training set today, but that kept me up all night, several nights in a row right before the NIPS deadline. Uh, and then I said, okay, can we teach it Morse code? Uh, so let's, let's use a binary representation of Morse code. We won't try to do listening to things coming in over the radio. But let's just give it ones and zeros. You all know what Morse code is, yeah? Back in the day. So a dot we're going to represent as one zero, and a dash is one one zero. Okay, and when you get to the end of the letter, you add an extra zero. That's the only time you see two zeros in a row. Okay, so letter V, da 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 da, no coincidence, is one zero one zero one zero one one zero dot 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 dash, and then the token that says, okay, we're all done with this letter. The letters are three to twelve time steps long. Okay. Smallest one is a dot and then a one and two zeros. That's uh, a E, I believe. Uh, a dash and two zeros is T and so on. So Morse, when he was inventing the Morse code, knew a little bit about frequency of letters and the most common letters in English got the shortest codes. Okay. So he was an information theorist in his day. Uh, at the start of each letter, uh, what we wanted to do is the output should all be zero except at the end of the letter. Then it lights up one of 26 outputs. What letter did we see? And also lights up one output that says we're at the end of a letter. The rest of the time the output should all be zero. So it's not getting a lot of feedback in the middle of the thing. We're just telling it to produce the right character at the end and a one or a zero. And, and that extra strobe 
output. Uh, so, and at the start of each letter, after it sees this strobe output, the one that says we're at the end of the letter, we zero the state and get ready for the next letter. Okay, that's a little extra clue you added. Uh, okay, so you see what the game is. Uh, we trained on the entire set of 26 patterns repeatedly. In 10 trials, it learned the task perfectly every time. Uh, it created an average of 10.5 hidden units. Uh, note that the strings can be as long as 11 or uh, 11, I guess, in this case. <coughs> so it doesn't even need a hidden unit for each time step in the thing it's recognizing. It certainly doesn't even need a hidden unit for each letter. Okay, it's remembering some internal states. You know, we've got two dots so far, things like that. And it's an average of 1,321 tra training epochs over the 26 patterns. Okay, and learned it perfectly. So, not too bad. Uh, again, this surprised, surprised me it worked that well. I was, I was quite excited. And then let's try a curriculum version of this. Let's teach it, instead of teaching it the whole code at once, presenting all the letters, let's teach it the short ones and then the harder ones and the harder ones and harder ones. Would that work better? So the first thing we did was presented E one dot and T one dash, training those outputs in the strobe. Okay, just train it that much. Then increasing sequence length, we train the ones with two dots and dashes. I'm sorry, it's, we weren't counting dots and dashes at this point. We were counting the one zero, length of the one zero sequence. Okay, so uh, these are the shortest, these are the next shortest, then there's a group here, longer, longer, longer still, and these are the longest ones. Uh, these are like uh, 9, 10, 11. Okay, and we train these separately. We don't, we don't go back and retrain the earlier ones. Okay, but remember, every time it creates a feature, that's, that's not going to be given up. That's welded into the network. And then finally, just to smooth things out, we train, train over the whole set, just to get them all from stepping on each other. Okay. Uh, we ran 10 trials. Uh, e and T were learned perfectly, usually with two hidden units. Each additional lesson added one or two additional hidden units. Final combination training added two or three units. Overall, all 10 trials were perfect, created an average of 9.6 units. Okay, 9.6 bits of memory, if you will. Uh, required an average of 1,427 epics versus 11321 uh, for training them all at once. So a few more epics, but these epics are like one-fifth of the training set. So it's roughly saved about 50% of the training time measured in the number of multiplies based on the size of the network and the size of the epics and everything else. So training with the easy and then harder and harder and harder saved you half the training time. On more complex problems, I'm sure it would be a much bigger effect. Okay, everybody with me? So, uh, published those two papers, the money for neural net research in the US went to zero. At least I could not get any more. Not from NSF, not from DARPA, not from anybody. Industry wasn't even funding this kind of stuff. Uh, so I went and did other stuff. 20 years later, uh, this stuff became popular again. Now Jeff Hinton, off in Canada, there was a little trickle of money the whole time. He was able to keep his uh, research effort alive, so was Yoshio Bengio. Uh, here we shut it down. Uh, so I worked on uh, fluorescent light microscopes uh, and computer processing of the images, and I went and ran a research lab for a while for a Japanese company. Anyway, uh, Finally came back, uh, we did consider a few variants before we completely shut it down. There was something called Cascade 2. 
Cascade correlation is very good for discrete binary outputs. If you're trying to predict analog values, like for a time series, okay, the price of some stock tomorrow based on everybody wants to do that problem. They think they're going to get rich doing it, not realizing that the stock market is re reacting to outside influences that are often unique, like a trade war with China, uh, which can affect some industries and not others. Uh, a bunch of things we thought about but didn't get very far in implementing. So Cascade 2 used a slightly different way of training the units to correlate. The hidden units these create tend to saturate and they tend to drive the outputs to 1 or 0. They're not good for continuous units. So there's a different training measure we use to get continuous outputs working better. Uh, and that was what we called Cascade 2. So for continuous output problems, for prediction problems, that worked better. Uh, this didn't get published. Uh, this, we were busy shutting down everything at that point. Uh, but I've got a, a sort of a tech report people can see if they want. Uh, we looked at, very briefly, at mixed unit types in the pool. You could have Gaussian units that are grabbing spots in the input space, blobs. Uh, you could have edge detector units. Uh, you could have a mixture in the candidate pool. Train them all up. Whoever's grabbing the most error, he gets tenure. Oh, this, we got a Gaussian unit. Now we got an edge detector. Okay, now we got a plain old sigmoid. Okay, these guys all get put in the network. They got tenure. You keep massacring the others. Okay, so a nice way to see what kind of units, what kind of receptive fields, what kind of... Uh, uh, activation function you want, uh, you can try a mixture. And we thought about looking at different delays and delay types. Uh, after we published the cas recurrent cascade correlation result, uh, some people said, well, you know, this can't learn any finite state machine because it can't learn something that ignores its inputs and just does a mod 3 counter. It could do 2, 4, 6, 8, couldn't do mod 3. Couldn't do mod any prime number that we couldn't build out of something that had period 2. OK. Because all we've got is direct outputs in period 2. Now, it would be easy to have periods 3 and 7 and some units that do those things. But we didn't, we didn't get far enough to try that. Uh, or we could build something that's a little more like LSTMs as a kind of unit. And it could have variable delay. If we wanted to do real speech, Right from the signal, we'd have to have continuously variable delay because people can speak very fast or they can speak very slowly. Okay, and you want the same network to kind of work on those things, so you've got to have, in some sense, uh, learnable, tunable delay. Uh, again, that's something that hasn't been tried, as far as I know, by anyone. Uh, there was a paper that also didn't get published that I did with Shumit Baluja. Uh, it had a mixture of descendant and sibling units. Every time you add a new unit in Cascor, the network gets deeper. Okay. That's not always an advantage. Sometimes it's ignoring that previously built thing. You just want six separate things looking at the inputs, but they don't need to be looking at each other. So there's no need for those networks to get deeper. So we had a candidate pool with like four descendant units that are looking at the most previously added thing and four that, that were sibling units that were looking at the same inputs as the last guy you added, but not his output. Okay? And whichever one did better with a slight preference, a slight bias in favor of the ones that were not deepening, that's what you picked. Okay, so if it's not buying you much to make the network deeper, you don't do it. And if you want to put this thing on a cell phone, I guess there may be some advantage not to making these networks deeper and deeper. Okay, after training. Uh, a lot of people have suggested uh, you're training up this pool of candidate units, and why don't you tenure more than one? It's been suggested around the university, too. Uh, and you could do that, but if they're redundant, you don't want to add more than one. If you could say there are six guys here who are correlating with the residual error in interesting ways and they're not redundant, then tenure more than one from that batch. 
Okay, we, that's an idea, we haven't tried it. Uh, there's a fellow in, uh, named Tom Schultz uh, at McGill, who's a psychologist, and he was using Kaskar as a model for children's learning. If you're teaching children how balance beams work, you know, uh, we put two blocks here and one block there, but it's farther out, you know, so it ought to balance. Uh, kids kind of go up and they reach a plateau, he observed. And then the next thing clicks in and they go up and they reach a plateau and that, that was to him reminiscent of the way Kaskar learned. The kid just got the new hidden unit, wow. You know, now he can do distance from the axis. Uh, so he's been playing around with Kaskar as a model for, for years now, decades now. Kaskar as a model for children learning. But along the way he came up with something he called knowledge-based cascade correlation and I don't like the name. But he was taking train networks and using them as candidate hidden units. Whole complicated networks that did something and were cooked up one way or another. And those were his hidden units and he was adding them with the same regime. So that's an interesting idea. These things have only been very lightly explored, if, if at all, in practice. So key ideas, take home, take home message. Build just the structure you need. Don't try to carve the filters you need out of a huge, deep block of weights. That's very inefficient. Okay, so I claim. Trainer add one unit, feature detector at a time, and then you add it and you freeze it. And then you train the network to use it, and you do it again, you do it again. Uh, this eliminates the efficiency due to the moving targets and the herd effect. You're only training one unit at a time. They're not messing with each other while they're learning. Freezing allows for incremental lesson plan training. Once you've got a useful feature detector, you're not going to steal it for something else and then wish you had it back because now you've got a data set that needs it again. Unit training and selection is very parallelizable, especially almost all the time goes into not training the output weights but training those candidate units. And that's very easily parallelizable onto as many machines as you've got. And, you know, you could have big candidate pools for harder problems, looking at a lot of options at once. You train each unit to cancel some residual error. Uh, I don't know if you've taken machine learning courses and have heard about boosting. If you have a bad approximator, uh, weak, better than chance, but weak, uh, you can take another one that's better than chance, but weak in a different way and combine them. Train another one, combine it, combine it. That's what we're seeing here. So this is the boosting idea. I'm not famous for inventing boosting because I didn't do all the convergence theorems. Okay, so somebody else got the credit for all that. But this really was the same idea as boosting. Work on the residual error, keep grabbing a bite of it. And if you can prove that every time you can grab a bite of it, every time you can get a unit that correlates with the residual error, you can then put it in and cancel some. You're going to do better and better and better and it'll converge. Now I can't prove that we're always going to get something that correlates. Maybe somebody better at math than I am could prove it, but uh, proofs are not my thing. Uh, so I have some old code in common lisp and in C. Uh, it's serial so it would need to be ported to work on GPUs. Now I made this slide a couple of years ago. I've now got a PhD student who's working on porting this to more efficient things and he's looking at uh, data sets coming from the natural language area, uh, beginning to look at different variations on recurrence uh, to build a, some kind of a semantic parser. You know, we've got a million times more compute power than we had 28 years ago, so we can look at bigger problems without staying up all night. Uh, my primary focus is the SCONE knowledge base system. I'm pretty busy with that, uh, but I do spend a day or two a week looking at this stuff again because I've heard that neural nets are hot and we all ought to be working on that. Uh, so this is not, this is for me now a part-time effort, but I've got one PhD student and one undergrad who's working to get this thing running on PyTorch. Uh, and we'll, I'm meeting with him later today. We'll see what kind of progress he's making. Uh, perhaps tweaking the memory delay model uh, 
can help it to work on time continuous signals. Uh, we want to look at real natural language grammars and see what it can learn now that we can build much bigger Cascar nets. Uh, and that's really what my PhD student is starting to do, but it's a big space. It can, many people can be exploring it at once, I think. Uh, I think a convolutional version of this is, I said straightforward, I think that's optimistic, but it can be done. As you've got candidate units, some of them can be ones that scan themselves over the whole network. Now that's much more efficient, much more expensive kind of unit than one that just sits still and reads the inputs. Training it takes much more time. But again, they can all be trained in parallel. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and you've had convolutional neural nets, okay? Who, who, have we talked about that in this class? So it, you can look at it as a unit that's scanned over the whole network, or as a whole lot of units in a layer whose weights are ganged together. Okay, so you're always training the lower left weight of this uh, thing, and then the middle weight, and then the upper left, and so on. But they're, they're constrained to find the same feature all across. So you can think of it as training a lot of units at once with the weights ganged together so there's not so many variables. Or you can think of it as a unit that gets scanned. That's what the convolution means, basically. Okay, anyway, so we could have candidate units that are trained by scanning. Nobody's tried this as far as I know. It's, uh, it's going to burn a lot of cycles. You better have a, a GPU in your laptop, uh, if not a farm of them. Uh, so the hope is that this, it's worth coming back and looking at this again, maybe, because it might require less data, much less computation. Uh, it might be, well, it might also be uh, interpretable in ways that the over, overstuffed networks are not, okay? Because if you give a neural network way too many units, it's going to come up with distributed, very blurry, very, very redundant representations. You're not going to be able to tell what any of those units do. One thing my PhD student did was looked at word to vec. You put in a, a sequence of words and try to predict the next word. Or there are many variations on that. But it's creating units at sort of a bottleneck. And it's saying that this vector is sort of the word or topic vector for this particular corpus of natural language. The nice thing about cascade correlation is the first unit you add is sort of, is the strongest thing for discriminating what's, what's coming next, for discriminating the topic. And the next one is the second strongest, and so on, and so on, and so on. So not only does it create a pretty, pretty dense vector of uh, representation vector, for the word sequences that are going by. But it actually uh, sorts them in order. Now, we still have a lot of work to do to see exactly what those particular units are actually telling us, what each one is detecting. You know, this one is all the baseball words, and this one is all the sporting words, and so on. Uh, so anyway. Uh, it's a huge space. This is an idea that's not being exploited by very many people out there. It's surprising. I mean, the paper, the original paper has 4,000 citations now, which in CS is pretty good. Uh, it's my best paper by citation count. The recurrent cascade correlation paper only has a couple of hundred citations, and that's disappointing because I think it's a better paper. It really is doing something really cool with those grammars. And went away, I wasn't pushing this, I was busy with other stuff, and uh, deep learning took off and nobody's paying any attention to this. So, uh, you know, if people want to look for projects, there's some interesting things that can be done in here. Okay, uh, questions? I finished earlier, but I don't think any of you would object if, uh, if we finish, oh, yeah. Right. 
is there are, are there any differences to that? I mean, it's what are the unique pieces between those two ideas? So the fundamental idea of boosting is you come up with an approximator that's better than nothing. An approximator for the residual error. You're always working on the residual error, as does Cascar. And if you can come up with an approximator for that that's not redundant with the rest, that works on the residual error, that's better than nothing, you keep adding those, it gets better and better and better. Okay, and that's the theorem and that's the famous, the famous boosting idea. Uh, this is an instance of boosting. It's always working on the residual error. Each hidden unit it adds. Uh, if it's got a decent correlation, it will cancel some of the remaining error. If you can correlate with the remaining error, you can cancel some of it. And uh, so it's the same idea. The part I don't have for the proof is that you're always going to be able to come up with such a unit in the pool. Okay. Now it's a greedy algorithm, so is boosting. Neither of them can claim. Uh, so we could get a convergence proof, I'm sure. It's just a matter of somehow constraining what you're doing in the candidate pool so that you can guarantee that something is going to correlate at least a little bit. Uh, neither one, since they're both greedy algorithms, can, can get an optimality proof. So it, it's an instance of boosting. Now, other people with boosting use linear regression. They use logistic, you know, they use all sorts of crazy stuff for and the, the one thing that's different here is that you're working each time in an augmented feature space. You could have a cascade correlation that just keeps adding units but doesn't get any deeper, doesn't look at the previous ones. That's kind of like the boosting algorithms that are out there, although they're doing things more sophisticated than training up just a little, the next unit in a perceptron. You know, they're training up a logistic regression net or something. But uh, basically, it's the same idea. Is that? And, and when you train a when you train a candidate from the pool, yeah. are they all the same? Like, were you like in terms of activation, in terms of what these neurons look like? Were you altering? I looked at this. I looked at this a lot when we were doing the two spirals, because I had a lot of time on my hands because I was waiting for the thing to finish. Uh, we were using a pool of eight candidate units, typically. Five or six of them would be right on. They'd be really good. I couldn't tell if they were exactly redundant or not because I wasn't printing out the receptive fields. But they were getting very similar scores. And two or three of them would get stuck in some bad place. You know, there's a flat spot in the sigmoid curve and it wasn't, you know, something like that. Uh, so. Eight seemed like a good number because there are always multiple ones getting scores that were very close to one another. Uh, could have gotten away probably with a four unit pool or something like that. You know. I didn't want to waste any units. I wanted to, to get that 12 and not 15. Okay, so that's why I was uh, maybe using a bigger pool than I had to. But eight, eight, you know, by modern standards, that's nothing. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? So you talk about the sophisticated word that does way better than the traditional neural networks. Is there some cases that it does actually worse and where it didn't like this actually? You know, another thing we haven't put in here is uh, maximum margin, like support vector machines. So on some of the industrial data sets, we were losing out to support vector machines. Because the training set was small enough that you needed the maximum margin to get good generalization. Now, that could be added here. That output could be doing a support vector machine thing instead of a perceptron thing. It's a lot more expensive, but it's just one layer and you're, you're not training it very often. I mean, just, just once for every unit you add. Uh, so that's something where we, we were getting worse scores on some of the industrial data sets that just didn't have enough data to tell you where the plane ought to be. And if you were just learning until it got all the training points right, that wasn't good enough. You wanted to get to the maximum margin between the... Um, yeah, it got stuck on some things. As I said, this didn't work very well for continuous outputs until we put in the, the Cascade 2 
uh, metric. Mm. And of course, we haven't tried it on the sort of things they're using to find uh, kittens on the internet. So, you know, right now they're the champions of that. Could, could this work better? I don't know. Yes? Have you ever thought of applying Casper to sort of like transfer learning problems? Transfer learning? Yeah. Well, that, that uh, the curriculum learning is basically transfer learning. We train it to learn one dot and dash. Okay, that's data set one. And that trans, you know, and then we train it to have things with two or three dots or dashes. And it's building on that filter you built at the start. You're not retraining on that. But that's there as part of your material. So it is transfer learning. So you could take a network and train it on data set A and get it, get it really good and then bring data set B that's related. And it would use all that initial structure. It would use all the hidden units you built and build whatever else it needed. Maybe it's making no use of that at all. Maybe it's making a lot of use. It depends on the problem. But if those features are useful, it's going to grab onto them. So uh, it is very tiny example, but that was transfer learning in a way. Yes? So given, given that we currently have like, very big networks that are performing well, this uh, algorithm be done in the opposite way around, as in taking disappearing units that are already in a big network? Well, there's a huge industry out there that train a network, huge network, big old sloppy network and then try to digest away all the units that aren't being used. And they're trying to digest away all the things that are being kind of used, but the network is not, wouldn't care if it lost them. You do sensitivity analysis. There's another huge industry out there that's using something like uh, genetic algorithms to think up the network architecture. Uh, but all these things are training the whole network first, the hard way, and then digesting away to get a smaller network, and then maybe retraining what's left. Uh, this just does it. So I, I think this is a better idea. If, if you want a network that's uh, the right size for the problem, I think this is the best way to get it. Now, I'm biased. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, so the approach is out there for people who want to not guess the size of the network but somehow get it close to right is either to train a huge network or a whole bunch of huge networks and digest away or to use something like genetic algorithms to kind of hill climb toward the right. There are things out there that are kind of like Cascor but they're adding whole layers at a time. Uh, very few people trying to add one unit at once because they think they need a million units whether they do or not. You know, and so this looks slow. But uh, it's a lot faster to add a million units than to train a million units in situ because they're fighting with each other. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>